Hello, everyone, and welcome to Health Reform Beyond the Basics. Thank you for joining us for our fall series for coverage year 2024. Today's webinar is Preventing and Resolving Data Matching Issues. My name is Ayesat Odiale, and I'm the Health Projects Assistant at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Beyond the Basics is a project of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. It's designed to provide training and resources to facilitate enrollment in the ACA health insurance marketplaces and Medicaid. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is a nonprofit policy organization. We are not a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Beyond the Basics is aimed at healthcare assisters, advocates, state and local officials, and others who help people get and keep their health coverage. This webinar is not intended for press purposes, and while we hope you will learn a lot, we are not able to offer continuing education credit for our webinars at this time. Automated captions have been enabled for this webinar. To view them, click on the more option with three dots at the bottom of your screen, or you can click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of your screen. All participants are muted and in listen-only mode. But if you'd like to ask a question, you can click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your webinar screen and type your question in the box. We will be monitoring questions and will pause for Q&A during the presentation. We may not be able to answer every question asked, but we will have a record of all of your questions and we'll use them as a guide for future resources and presentations. And of course, you can email your questions during and after the webinar to beyondthebasics at cppp.org. And a quick reminder that you won't be able to click on the screen to go to any of the links shared in the deck, but we will put the link to the slides in the chat where you can find all active links to everything shared today. And after today's webinar, we will email a recording of the presentation along with links to the slides and other resources. And we will post everything to the Beyond the Basics website. Here you can see the schedule of webinars in our fall series. We've shared a lot of valuable content thus far and still have more to come with plan design and plan selection stra strategies, the annual renewal process, the second part of our webinar on eligibility and outreach and application issues for people who are immigrants, and our popular tying it all together webinar at the end where we talk about how all the concepts in the series fit together. Though we will still cover the same core concepts we always do, we've added new examples throughout the series and of course integrated updates as policies have changed. We're also pleased to be once again hosting a webinar in Spanish that focuses on enrollment issues most relevant for people who are immigrants and people who live in mixed immigration status households. We are also excited to be celebrating 10 years of marketplace coverage as a part of our series this year. And so as a part of the celebration at each webinar, we'll be spotlighting veteran assisters from around the country. Today's webinar will cover overview of data matching issues, verification of citizenship and immigration status, verification of household income, verification of other minimum essential coverage, general tips to prevent and resolve DMIs, and identity proofing for healthcare.gov. Today's presenters are Shelby Gonzalez, Vice President of Immigration Policy at CBPP, and Jenny Sullivan, Director of Health Coverage Access at CBPP. Now, I'll turn it over to Jenny for our anniversary segment and to get us started. Great, thank you so much, Ayasat, and welcome everyone. Our featured assister today is Paula Campbell, Director of Health Equity and Emergency Preparedness Response for the Illinois Primary Healthcare Association. And like so many people we've been featuring this fall, she has been at Marketplace Enrollment since the very beginning in 2013. She was nominated by Stephanie Becker at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, who describes Paula as a true leader in making sure that all assisters and navigators in Illinois have the information they need to enroll people around the state in coverage. She helped spearhead the statewide Illinois Coalition for Health Access Enrollment Assister Network, and she still leads it today. 
in her own words, um, her sort of advice and, and sort of acceptance speech, if you will, was that becoming the trusted face and voice in a community to help individuals and families understand their coverage options and then navigate how to use their coverage is one of the most fulfilling roles a person can have. Our community's health is our community's future. Thank you so much for your work and your leadership over this past decade, Paula. We are absolutely honored to feature you today and to send you your own Beyond the Basics anniversary tumbler. And with that, I will turn it over to Shelby to get us started. Thank you so much, Jenny. And I join you in celebrating Paula and so many of you that are on this call today that I know are doing amazing work in your communities to make sure people have health coverage. Next slide, please. So I'm going to kick us off with just doing an overview of verification and what data matching issues are in the marketplace. I just want to let you know that I'm going to be referring to um, both general rules that are applicable, no matter where, whether you are in a state that utilizes healthcare.gov as the platform for enrollment, um, or you're in a state with its own state-based marketplace. So there's going to be some underlining rules that I talk about. But then later, when we start talking about like actual application processes, and you'll see some slides that include screenshots and how questions are asked and that sort of thing. When that happens, I am being very specific about what that experience looks like on healthcare.gov. So I just want to just make sure that you understand that the, the, the information, a lot of information here is applicable no matter what, um, but we do utilize some examples in how the process works from, from the healthcare.gov vantage point. Next slide, please. So first, um, it is just kind of the universal truth that there are certain um, eligibility requirements, right? To enroll in the marketplace and other eligibility requirements um, to prove um, that you're eligible for premium tax credits. And in some cases, these factors can be a test to, you know, um, just as the person who is going through the application just provides that information and later um, is asked to um, attest that everything that they're telling in, the, in, in this, this um, application is truthful. So for many eligibility factors, um, it is enough um, to verify the, that factor by just simply attesting to that information being true and accurate. And an example of that often is state residency. Um, oftentimes it is just accepted and it does it, the, the the marketplace does not have to go and gather some additional evidence to prove that but certain eligibility factors must be verified through electronic data matching um, or through the applicant actually providing documents that serve as evidence that verifies their that that um, what they're telling about their circumstances is in fact accurate. And examples of, of different factors that must be verified in one way or the other, whether it's through electronic matching or whether it's through um, documents include things like citizenship, immigration status, and income. Next, oh, I'm gonna pause for one more second before we go to the next slide. Um, so over on the right-hand side of this, this page, we have kind of a depiction of what this federal hub is. And oftentimes you'll hear people talk about the federal hub. And basically it is just a mechanism that um, healthcare.gov and state-based marketplaces utilize to um, verify different factors electronically. So the way that works is that there's a lot of trusted sources of information um, so, for example, the Social Security Administration can verify um, for many people their attestation of citizenship. The um, IRS can verify for many people their, their, their attestation of income. So those are the kinds of um, different data sources that come from different services and that and as an individual types in their information into healthcare.gov or another um, marketplace that in real time, um, information provided is being checked against these systems. Next slide, please. 
but these are not infallible systems. They're not perfect. And when an individual um, is, it provides information and the marketplace is not able to have their attestation verified electronically, it does not mean that that person is not telling the truth. It just means that, that we can't verify it through the electronic means um, that are available for a variety of reasons. And when this occurs, it is said to, to be that we have a data matching issue. And that's when we always refer to it as a DMI. So data matching issue, DMI. So there's a lot of different reasons why this could occur. And one of them is just that data may not be available through the um, Federal Data Services Hub. Um, and, you know, there's lots of, lots, of, lots of different examples. So for example, if somebody has not filed taxes in the last year, maybe they didn't work last year. Maybe they just graduated from college and they have their new job and they, they, there's no record of their, their past taxes. Um, other examples are that U.S. citizenship um, you know, a lot of people cannot have their U.S. citizenship verified um, electronically in real time, um, especially if they went through the naturalization process to to get to get their citizenship. Um, so, so um, often, so sometimes there's just not enough information, and sometimes the match just isn't close enough, right? So um, the hub may not be reasonably compatible with that testation that the individual makes. And that might be, for example, like a mismatch in terms of income. Um, you know, the, the something might have changed drastically from one year to the other, um, including like a change of job, or maybe um, a new, a, a, you know, new child came into the family, and that's not reflected on the information that's available in the electronic um, sources. So lots of reasons that you might have a data matching issue. Really important to know that this does not mean that the person is not telling the truth. It just means that we have some limitations and, and data matching is not, um, you know, perfect. So next slide, please. So what happens when there's a DMI? When a DMI occurs, um, because information can't be verified, um, eligibility determination notice explains to the applicant that they need to provide more information um, to verify that testation that was made in the application. And um, generally, people can still enroll in the marketplace plan and generally they can still get um, advanced premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions while they are resolving the DMI. And the timeframes are slightly different between a DMI for the reason of um, citizenship or immigration status, which is generally 95 days um, from when the DMI um, occurred, or 90 days for income, although right now there's also an additional 60 day extension period for income related um, DMIs. So um, there's, there's some time when people have, um, that they can still be enrolled in the coverage um, while they are waiting for um, the DMI to be resolved, while they're taking action to gather the necessary proof. I um, mean, this can take a little bit of time sometimes. Um, next slide, please. So how will the person know? There's gonna be several different ways that the person knows that this DMI occurred. And one of them is um, right as you're proceeding, and this is one of those examples of when I say that we're gonna be showing you a little bit about what that looks like or the consumer experience on healthcare.gov. This is what it looks like on healthcare.gov. Um, on screen, the individual will get an, uh, this, this box that we're showing here. It says actions, next steps. And it will detail um, who in the, in the unit that is applying for coverage needs to take additional steps um, to finalize their, their eligibility. Um, the EDN, which is short for eligibility determination notice, will also detail and provide more information um, for the individual about what um, they need to be sent, what, what steps they need to do to resolve the, the eligibility um, data matching issue. Next slide, please. 
So here's another clearer example of, you know, the, the screenshot where it says your eligibility is temporary um, and it provides the date um, and that it, it alerts the individual that they're going to have to take some action. Next slide, please. And here's a more close up um, picture of what happens on the eligibility determination notice and what that looks like and how the individual um, will be told more specific information about who within the unit needs to be taking action and what, you know, what, what's going on. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, yeah, there will be, it's not like this is the end. This is the one chance to figure this out the individual will get additional notices after the initial warning that's going to come up on the screen after the eligibility determination notices it provides information there will be additional um, requests for documents that will that will be um, uh, that will come to the individual with a data matching issue so there will be a 90 day 60 day 30 day 15 day all these kind of um, you know notices and also that 15 day warning telephone call. So if the DMI is not resolved, then an expiration notice is sent, and that means that the DMI has expired, and um, that means that you know action is going to be taken, and that will be described on the expiration notice. When documents are submitted, um, if sufficient, the DMI is resolved and the marketplace sends that notice. So it says, all good, we've got what we need and everything's good. And if it's insufficient, the marketplace sends insufficient document notice and will also provide a warning phone call. So um, more information in the insufficient marketplace notice in terms of what is insufficient and what is needed. Next slide, please. So we're going to go through verification of citizenship and immigration status first. Next slide, please. I'm going to start with citizenship. So basically, when the market, and again, this is going to be describing how the sequence occurs within healthcare.gov. I suspect a very similar process, maybe not the same exact questions, maybe not the same, you know, always order or the, the same words, but there should be something pretty similar to this within state-based marketplaces as well. So what happens is that the applicant provides their social security number um, and attests to um, being a US citizen. So the, the applicant is, all applicants, people who are applying for coverage for themselves will be asked, are you a US citizen, right? And if the person says yes, healthcare.gov will attempt to take information that's been provided in the application, including the social security numbers, and it will send something, send, um, something to the social security administration to see if SSA can um, substantiate citizenship um, for the applicant. And if it can't, then the applicant is going to be asked if they are a naturalized or derived citizen. And if so, they're going to be asked to provide some numbers that would appear on their either naturalization certificate or certificate of citizenship. If the person provides that information, then healthcare.gov will try and verify citizenship through um, the systematic alien verification for entitlements program known as SAVE, um, which is um, run by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so that is how um, there would be the attempt. I will let you know that I, at least it's been in my experience and it's just anecdotal that oftentimes people do not have those documents like at their fingertips. You know, they might have their passport, which, you know, we can talk about later on how that could be utilized. But oftentimes, you know, people don't like carry around, like they carry around their driver's license or, um, you know, other other numbers that you're, you're regularly asked for. People who are U.S. citizenships aren't, you have U.S. citizenship aren't generally asked to provide proof utilizing one of those those documents. Um, so it might be something that that um, I know, at least it's been my experience that you wanna just get 
everything. Like when you have, when you're working with a person, you want to get as much information into the application right then and there, because, you know, who knows, it's just really hard to follow up and gather more information later. So this is sometimes presents a little bit of a challenge because people who come to an appointment, for example, might not be carrying around, oftentimes will not be carrying around these documents with them. Just a heads up. Next slide, please. So if let's say that an individual's um, citizenship has not been able to be verified electronically through SSA or through SAVE, um, there are, um, they, they have the opportunity to provide documents that can prove their citizenship. And one of them I mentioned beforehand, right? Their US passport, and not everybody has one, right? Getting a US passport is expensive. And unless you're traveling there, you know, not everybody has one, but the US passport is one of those pieces of documents as are all of the documents on this slide. They're the kind of documents that an individual can turn in to prove their citizenship status without having to send in another document. Um, so th this alone can prove their citizenship, but that is not the case for everything. So on this, on this form, these are somewhat like your first tier. Like if somebody can turn one of these in, you try and do that, right? Because it's, it's um, a one document type of verification. So passport, certificate of citizenship, certificate of naturalization, or state issued enhanced driver's license. So, you know, there, there are more and more states that, you know, are, you know, have those. Other documents, um, a tribal enrollment card, a certificate of um, degree of Indian blood, um, a tribal census document. Um, so there are other kinds of documents as well. But in general, if one of these documents that aren't listed here are not available to the individual that you're helping, then on the next slide, um, we will look at, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we're going to be looking at trying to gather two pieces of evidence um, to be able to prove citizenship um, for the individual. So, First, you are going to have to have one of the documents on the left side of this um, table. And you can see, I'm not, and I promise I will not read you this whole list, but you can see that there's lots of different documents that an individual could, could um, use to prove citizenship, but it's really not going to be enough. In addition to one of those documents, they would have to have a piece of document that the intention is to also prove identification. So it matches up the citizenship document, one of the documents on the left, with an identification document, one of the documents on the right. And, um, you know, this is not a perfect world. And matching these up sometimes can be a challenge. Um, and we could even debate whether or not we think that some of these should, you know, the, these, these, you know, are attainable or, you know, easily, or, or you know, it's, it's not gonna be that easy. So again, always wanna do what we can to provide all the information up front in the application. And hopefully people do not have a DMI. If they do, number one, you wanna try and see if they have one of those documents that can prove with one document. But if not, then we go into the process of trying to prove citizenship with this two-step process. And you'll notice all the way at the end of, in some cases, there might be even three pieces of documentation some people might have to have. But in general, one document from the left side and one document from the right side of this, this table will, will do the trick um, to prove citizenship. Next, next slide, please. So how the marketplace verifies immigration status. So now we're at a place where the individual has said no when they were asked about their, um, about their US citizenship. And then next they will be asked um, whether or not they have an eligible immigration status for marketplace coverage um, or just coverage, it might be, it's a little, I can't, I can't see the, the full um, slide, but um, the, the question is not super, super um, helpful. And you can see that it has a link 
um, which provides a list of statuses that would make somebody eligible. Um, and then the idea is that the individual would see themselves in that list if they do have one of those statuses and then they could say, yes, they have a, uh, um, an eligible immigration status, if that is the case. And um, in the case that they don't, but maybe they are utilizing this, you know, healthcare.gov to apply for um, Medicaid payment of um, limited emergency services for life-threatening conditions, they're, you know, the, they're, they have the other choice of selecting the other, um, the other option as well, okay? So we're gonna assume that this person has said that it's applying has said, yes, they have an eligible immigration status. Next, they're going to be asked to select the document type that corresponds with their status. They will have this long list of different um, statuses, uh, different, um, different document types that they can choose from. And then there will be um, a series of numbers that they will be asked to provide based off of what would be available on their, um, their document that they've identified. Then what will happen is that the marketplace will send that information along with other information that was provided on, on the application like name and date of birth and other, other identifying factors. They will send that information to the SAVE and SAVE will try to um, electronically verify the, the attestation of immigration status being eligible for marketplace coverage. Next slide, please. So similar to what we talked about earlier, there's going to be reasons why there's data matching that, that, that will not be successful, right? And it doesn't mean that the person is not, you know, um, telling the truth. It means that we live in a world that is imperfect and data matching is imperfect. And Sometimes there could just be mistypings, right? Like this stuff happens all the time. There's a lot of information provided in the application. And sometimes you, you might have a mismatch because maybe the numbers were wrong or maybe um, there was a typo or maybe somebody's changed their name. Maybe they got married um, and changed their name or change their name for any other reason, right? Um, and SAFE doesn't have the updated records. So they're unable to, for a variety of reasons, do the matching. And there are there's limitations. SAFE just simply doesn't have the ability to verify immigration status instantly for every um, applicant. There are certain statuses in particular or certain circumstances in particular that people might be going through that would make it so that there's more than one step that SAVE has to do to be able to verify. And quite frankly, there are cases when somebody from, from the Department of Homeland Security has to actually go and physically look up the documents. So this is an imperfect work. So that could happen and that might take a little bit longer. So again, sometimes data matching issues happen for a variety of reasons. Next slide, please. When that happens, then um, the individual can, um, oh, actually here, this is the document types and we, we have um, listed here what people are going to be asked to provide on the application, depending on the application type that they, the document type that they've identified in the application. So I'm not gonna read these, but it's just helpful as a resource to you. And we actually have another resource on the website that provides these numbers there, as well as sample cards to look for um, where you would look for, for the different kind of cards, uh, different kind of numbers and different cards. Next slide, please. And just, additional documents and more of the kind of numbers you're going to be looking for on the different documents. Next slide, please. And uh, like I mentioned, we have a reference guide. I'm not going to go through these. I am going to just note that as you can see here in this example of what's oftentimes referred to as a green card, it's um, the, the card that people with lawful permanent residence um, have. This is an example of it. And it is, um, you know, 
it, these numbers are not going to be like super crystal clearly labeled the same way that the numbers are asked on the application. So for example, we gave the example here where um, the, the number is labeled as USCIS number, but the, you know, as I showed you in a couple slides ago in that table, um, it, the healthcare.gov application is going to say, what's the person's A number, right? The alien number, which we don't like, I don't like using the word alien, but that is the, not the, the word that is utilized. It's not it, going to be intuitive for you to know or anybody to know that what they mean by that is also the USCIS number, right? <laughs> so this is challenging. And that's why there's a whole reference guide that we put together. Healthcare.gov has one too. Um, we like that ours kind of compiles everything in all one place so that you're not having to go from screen to screen. But um, either one of those documents would be helpful to utilize and just have there on your desktop so that you can refer to them when you're helping people because it's not, this isn't stuff that you're gonna just memorize oftentimes unless you were working with a lot of people who are in the weeds. Next slide, please. So if a DMI, related to immigration status or citizenship status is not resolved. The applicant um, is unable, um, th they will be able to have a 95 day window when they can they can you know, select a plan, they can enroll a plan in general. They can also even get um, coverage, you know, their, their PTC and, and CSRs during this time. And um, they can, you know, they can choose a plan um, you, and then, and then even if they um, they end up, so it's kind of important to remember that citizenship and immigration status, it's a requirement to even get a plan in in the marketplace, right? You can't even um, inject. There's a there's one exception, one state, Washington State, but um, but in general, you must meet that requirement to be able to purchase a marketplace plan. So what it means is, is once that 95 day window is done and you've gotten an expiration notice and you have, um, you know, cause you have not resolved your DMI, you're, you're no longer able to keep your plan at all. Okay. That's different than an income DMI as you'll hear about shortly. Um, so just keep that in mind people who resolve their DMIs after that window can come back um, and they have, you know, SEP option um, and they can choose to either enroll pro enroll, um, you know, prospectively or retroactively. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through a scenario as quickly as possible because I am running out of time. In this sample, we have Laura, and she lives with um, her mother, Julieta, and her daughter, Martina, and they are all applying for coverage on healthcare.gov. And Laura um, has completed the naturalization process to become a U.S. citizen. Julieta um, um, has been in the U.S. for eight months and is applying for asylum. She recently obtained authorization to work. Yay, Julieta. And Martina was born in North Carolina and has U.S. citizenship. She was born in the U.S. Next slide. Um, all the families provide their social security numbers on the application and La um, Laura and Martina attest to being U.S. citizens. Laura um, is asked if she is a naturalized or derived citizen. And um, she says that she is a naturalized citizen. Um, but she does not have a certificate of naturalization. As I mentioned earlier, that's, that might happen sometimes. Um, so she skips the questions about um, document numbers and um, no additional information is asked of, of Martina um, after her completing her citizenship at the station. Julieta attests to having an eligible immigration status and she provides an A number only. Um, next slide, please. So how does the data matching work out for this family? Lauda, um, remember that she did not have her, any information about her naturalization from her naturalization document. There's no match with SSA because like I mentioned, sometimes people who are naturalized, not, ever, not all the time, but a lot of the time, there will not be an SSA match. Um, and SAVE was not able to match either because she did not have the document numbers to provide. Martina um, 
uh, she did she matched as an individual but but SSA was not able to I'm sorry Martina is you, you know what we flipped the names on this slide so Martina is the little girl so she would be up here she did have a match with SSA and Julieta is the mother um so you can see that the pictures are just flipped on this slide that's a little like typo of ours but um Pretend that you have Julieta down at the bottom, who's the mom of Laura. And Laura, uh, I mean, and Julieta, there is no match with SSA. Um, it's not going to be relevant to, to, because she's not a citizen, so they don't match her citizenship status. And the match with SAVE um, did not work because it was, just wasn't enough information um, provided. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, eligibility results. Laura and Julieta are instructed to provide documents to provide their status within 95 days, and all family members are approved to buy a marketplace plan and are awarded advanced premium tax credits. So um, everybody is going to proceed with picking a plan and getting their, um, you know, with APTCs um, in the meantime. Next slide, please. Laura and Julieta get warning notices and emails explaining that their coverage will end if not if um, sufficient documents are not submitted. And Laura and Julieta submit documents, but they were not sufficient for Julieta. Julieta sent in a letter that she received from DHS about her application, but it did not contain sufficient information. Next slide, please. So Julieta is confused about what to send in. So she sends in that letter that I just mentioned and she gets the, you know, a data, it's not enough. You know, we're, we're running out of time at this point and we ran out of time. She gets an expiration notice and she's told that her coverage will end because she did not provide um, proof of her immigration status. Next slide, please. So Julieta can still regain cover. We will say that she um, does send in um, a copy of her work authorization. And after um, that, is, she uploads it up to her healthcare.gov account. And then her DMI is resolved. And she has the option to either, um, she can either have her coverage um, in APTC moving forward forward, you know, um, you know, during that SCP, or she can have, or she can have um, her coverage retroactive as of May 1st when she had lost coverage. So that is the end of this example. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it over to Jenny. Great. Thanks, Shelby. And we see your questions coming in. I know folks are, have lots of them, so we will try to get through all of our content so that we can answer those. But just a reminder that you can also email your questions to beyondthebasics at cbpp.org, and we will answer them um, after the webinar today. So now let's talk about verification of household income. Next slide. So as you know, applicants attest to their projected income for the upcoming year when they apply for coverage during open enrollment. So this year, people will attest to their expected income for next year in 2024. And they have to do this for every person and every source of income in the household, including people who aren't themselves applying for coverage. These attestations are usually matched with IRS tax return data in the federal data hub that shall be described earlier. Um, and the most recent data that the Federal Data Hub will have for open enrollment this year is tax data for when people filed for 2022 earlier this year. So that'll be the most recent income data that they have. People's circumstances change throughout the year. And so things could have changed quite a lot from what somebody experienced in 2022 and what they expect to be experiencing in 2024. And this is where sometimes DMIs come in. Um, we'll talk lots about those, but just a note that there is something new for next year, um, or really for open enrollment this year. If the IRS doesn't have income data for a person, and the person provided all the information the application needed to, to pull that information if it existed, then the marketplace will now accept that person's income attestation without requiring additional verification. This saves the marketplace time and um, CMS has determined that this is not a significant program integrity risk. And so people will be allowed to 
attest to their income and not have to resolve any sort of DMI um, in order to enroll. They'll, of course, have to reconcile on the back end if they receive um, premium tax credits in advance, but they won't have to do the DMI process on the front end. Um, and just a note that if you're in a state-based marketplace state, this is also true, but your state may have additional um, income databases that it uses to verify income, and so it still may use those, and it may generate a DMI if there is a discrepancy there. It just depends on the state. Next slide. So data matching is going to work for lots and lots of people. But um, as with citizenship and immigration status, there are lots of reasons why income might not be successfully verified using data matching. So if you're helping a household affected by any of the circumstances on this slide, it is not at all surprising that they would get an income-related DMI. Next slide. So the general rules go like this. Um, if a person, so if, if a person, um, well, the reason they exist is to prevent somebody from A, having to pay back a lot of money at tax time if what they projected is way off base and they were never eligible for that in the first place, but also, um, which is not something that we want consumers to be experiencing, um, first of all, and it also protects the integrity of the program. We want the people um, who are eligible for, for the assistance to be the ones that are getting it. Um, so if somebody projects a higher income than the information available about their income in the hub, this is typically not going to trigger a DMI because it would result in the person getting less financial help. If their income actually ends up being lower than what they project, it just means they're going to get more money back when they reconcile their taxes um, the, the following year. But if somebody projects a lower income than the information available about them in the hub, then this could result in the person getting more financial help than they're ultimately eligible for. So here are what the rules are. And they did change last year. This year, they are the same as last year. To trigger a DMI, a person's income has to have gone down by a certain amount. If their estimated income has gone down by less than 50% compared to their income in the hub, or by less than 12%, or I'm sorry, $12,000 total, then they're in the clear. This does not trigger a DMI. On the other hand, if the difference between their income in the data hub and their projected income is more than $12,000 and more than 50% of the income about them in the data hub, then this would trigger a DMI that the person has to resolve by submitting additional documentation. The person will still get APTCs and CSRs if they qualify based on their projected lower income amount. They just have to provide documentation to verify that that change has happened or that they reasonably expect it to happen in the coming year. Next slide. Um, as with um, immigration status and citizenship, there are lots of documents a person can use to verify their income and to verify that their income has gone down. And this table shows different documents for different kinds of income. These are mostly tax documents, but you can see that in some cases, a person may also be able to use pay stubs, bank statements, or other papers. And these are all listed on healthcare.gov as well. You've got the link at the bottom there. Next slide. Healthcare.gov has um, some helpful resources if you are assisting somebody with resolving a DMI with income. Um, just wanted to point out this consumer guide for annual household income data matching issues is a good one to download or to bookmark and have at your fingertips. It includes um, worksheets for documenting self-employment income, a list of income documents that can be used to resolve um, income DMIs, and then it walks through some examples. So just wanted to point that one out. Next slide. But in some cases, people are not going to have documentation. They're not going to have any of the things on that list or can't get their hands on them easily. And the good news is there is another option. People can submit a written signed explanation of what's going on with them, and that is acceptable. Um, you don't have to prove that the other documents aren't available. You just have to explain why your new projected income is a reasonable projection, and you want to include the key information that the marketplace can use to identify and attach this information to a specific application, like the application ID, the person's name, date of birth, and the other people in the household, um, and their income sources as well, if they, if they have income in addition to the um, main tax filer. Um, next slide. But what happens if um, somebody doesn't resolve an income-based DMI? Um, well, in the past, people have been required to resolve um, income DMIs within 90 days, but that is changing this year. 
the marketplace is now going to provide an automatic 60-day extension, as Shelby mentioned earlier. This is true in all states, not just healthcare.gov states. Um, in their reasoning behind this, um, they explained that about a third of people, um, CMS explained that about a third of people who resolved an income DMI took more than 90 days, and the people that took the longest tended to have the lowest incomes. So this change is really designed to give people more flexibility and provide a more equitable approach to income verification. Now, after the 60-day extension, so 150 days total since the original DMI was generated, if it remains unresolved, then the APTC, the marketplace will either change the APTC or terminate it depending on what, the what should happen based on the income available about the person in the data hub. If somebody has set up automatic withdrawals from their bank account to pay their premiums, then the new higher amount would be deducted. And that's something certainly to watch out for because we don't want people to be um, surprised by any you know, unexpected higher deductions. And if the person is invoiced for premiums, and so that's not coming out of their bank account, which is good, but if they're getting bills and they're not paying those bills, then they could fall into a grace period and risk losing their marketplace coverage. Um, and for more on premium payment and grace period rules, you can reference the fact sheet linked in the upper corner of the slide. Um, but really the best thing to do is just to try and resolve that DMI um, because if you're going to lose your financial assistance, coverage may ultimately become unaffordable for you and um, you may need to terminate it so that you don't um, get into a, a grace period situation. Um, the other thing to note is that 150 days is not the last the last stop. If somebody is making um, a good faith effort to resolve the DMI and they've reached that point and they still need more time, they can still call the marketplace and ask for an additional extension. These are granted on a case by case basis, but it's absolutely available. Um, but remember, the simplest route is probably to submit a written explanation if you've gotten to this point and um, been uh, unable to produce other formal documentation. Next slide. So let's walk through um, an example. This is a case where a DMI is not triggered. So we've got Jesse, he's self-employed self and he recently started his own food truck. But in 2022, he worked as a line cook at a restaurant. And at that time, his annual income was $32,000. But he left that job at the end of 2022 and he's working on getting this food truck business started. So he spent money buying a truck, having other business, uh, paying other business expenses like his licensing fees, his insurance, advertising, et cetera. And when he applies for 2024 coverage, he attests to a total projected income for 2024 of $26,000. This is his gross income minus his business expenses. This is $6,000 lower than his income on his 2022 taxes which is less than $12,000, and it's less than half of his 2022 income. So it doesn't trigger a DMI. He's good to go. He will get APTCs based on that um, attested $26,000 income. Next slide. But now let's change things up a little and say that Jesse left a job as a restaurant manager in 2022 to start his food truck. So in 2022, his annual income was $55,000. When he applies for 2024 coverage, We'll assume he has the same gross income and expenses as in the previous example. So he's expecting about $26,000 um, in income in 2024. This is a difference of $29,000 compared to his 2022 income, which is more than $12,000 and more than half of his 2022 income. So this is outside the allowable thresholds and it triggers a DMI. Now remember, it's not the end of the world. The sky is not falling. We can resolve this. So Jesse reported his income as $26,000 on the application and the marketplace is gonna go ahead and provide him APTCs based on that amount from day one, but his um, eligibility determination notice will tell him that he has 90 days to submit the required verification to um, clear the DMI. Of course, he'll get that automatic 60 day extension if he needs it. And if he still needs more time after 150 days has passed, he can call the call center to um, request an extension. If he doesn't do that and doesn't resolve the DMI, then the marketplace is going to revert to using his 2022 income as the basis for determining his APTCs. He won't lose financial help altogether necessarily, but the amount that he gets is going to go down. Now, he will be able to recoup this when he reconciles um, his 2024 um, taxes, so in spring of 2025, 
that's a long time from now. And it would be better for him to get all the financial help he's eligible for um, as he's paying for and receiving coverage. Okay, next slide. So how can Jesse resolve the DMI? Well, he could submit a business ledger to show his business and income expenses, or he can submit a written statement like we talked about before. You can just do the math, write a short explanation, and um, talk about why he doesn't expect to replace the lost income in 2024. Next slide. So if a person has um, a DMI and they lose their APTCs, they can actually restore them if they submit documentation along with an explanation, um, or they could go into the application and correct their income projection to align with the data in the hub if that is, you know, they realize they made a mistake or their ex expectations for what's going to happen next year have changed. And um, if they do that, then they can get the, their APTCs restored. And even if the 90 day plus 60 day automatic extension has, has expired, which means their APTCs have gone down or potentially gone away, if they go ahead and submit documentation, they should be able to restore APTCs. Now, if they've lost coverage altogether, maybe they've decided that, you know, or they, they've not been able to keep, um, keep coverage, they can file an appeal. And if they're successful, they can get the PTCs retroactively. If they're unsuccessful, they can still get PTCs back for the gap months when they file their tax return, assuming that it, it verifies what their new sort of lower projected income. The hitch is that they need to have remained enrolled throughout those months, which many marketplace enrollees are not going to be able to afford to do without financial help. So resolving these things um, as early as possible is always going to be in the consumer's best interest. Next slide. Okay, so one more example. Um, this is Liv. Liv attests to an annual projected income of $22,000 for 2024. But their income on their 2022 tax return was $35,000. So this triggers the DMI. Now they enroll in a silver cost sharing reduction plan with APTC, but they don't currently have a permanent address, so they miss the notices about needing to provide documentation to resolve the DMI. As a result, their APTCs and CSRs are reduced after 150 days. Now, Liv learns about the DMI when they try to get a prescription filled and get hit with higher out-of-pocket costs than they were expecting. So they have a few options here. Liv can submit documents to verify their income now and restore the full APTC and CSR. They could also appeal. They lost coverage, for example, because they stopped paying the higher premiums they're charged now that their APTC is lower, then they would need to appeal to regain coverage. Um, but unlike the citizenship and immigration DMI, there's no special enrollment period if they lose coverage due to a drop in APTCs. Um, Fortunately, the appeal is pretty straightforward. They submit the information that they should have in the first place to resolve the DMI if they had actually gotten the notices. And um, if it's successful, then they get their APTCs and CSRs restored. Um, and those can be retroactively or prospectively, whichever they prefer. Or finally, they could stay in their current plan and pay the higher premium with the higher cost sharing amounts. And they'd still be able to get any PTC they're ultimately eligible for back when they file taxes, but again, they're not going to get um, the CSRs back after the fact. They're just going to pay higher um, cost sharing for any care that they receive in 2024, which is um, which is not ideal. Next slide. Um, oh, we are so running out of time. Um, let's talk about a few other um, a few other DMIs not related to to income and um, citizenship and immigration. Next slide. So this is for uh, minimum essential coverage. It's when there's an electronic match with a state Medicaid agency, Medicare, or the Office of Personnel Management for federal government employees that can trigger a DMI if the match shows that someone applying for marketplace coverage is enrolled in or eligible for another form of minimum essential coverage. So somebody gets this kind of DMI, they can enroll in coverage with APTC based on their attestation, as you can with other, um, with the income DMI, but they would need to submit documents to prove that they're not eligible for or enrolled in other coverage. This could be a letter from an insurance company with a termination date or a termination notice from a Medicaid or CHIP agency, et cetera. But they only have 90 days to resolve this. No additional automatic extensions as with the income DMI. Um, they, they need to resolve it within 90 days. Next slide. There's also something called periodic data matching that can trigger a DMI. 
Um, this is something that happens during the coverage year, not at open enrollment. But the marketplace is checking sort of in the background to see if people are enrolled in other coverage. And if a person is found to be enrolled in Medicaid, CHIP, or Medicare, and they're getting APTCs, then the marketplace is going to send them a notice and give them just 30 days to resolve the issue before their APTCs would be terminated. So for Medicaid and CHIP, if the person is actually enrolled, then the notice asks them to end their marketplace coverage. If they're not enrolled in Medicaid or CHIP, then the notice tells them to update their marketplace application. If they don't act, then they're going to lose their APTC and they're going to be billed for the full premium in mark of, for their marketplace coverage. For Medicare, the marketplace will terminate APTCs, but leave the marketplace plan in effect at full cost. Or if a person elected to have marketplace coverage end when they become Medicare eligible, as many people do, the household's enrollment in the marketplace plan will be terminated altogether. If the marketplace plan is terminated, then other folks in the family get, get an SEP to enroll in um, to, to enroll in other coverage, enroll in marketplace coverage again as a separate group. Um, but these interactions can get pretty complicated. And we do get a lot of questions about marketplace Medicare um, transitions. So we'll be covering them more at our Tying It All Together webinar on October 24th. Um, with that, I know we don't have many much time left, but I'm gonna pass it back to Shelby. Thanks, Jenny, and I'll go really fast. Um, first, I'm gonna fly through these tips to prevent and resolve um, DMIs, mostly because we've kind of covered a lot of them. And second, because they're kind of, the pretty self, self-explanatory. So next slide, please. So first, um, you know, it's just really important to provide as much information as possible, be as clear as possible, check the, you know, that you, you wrote the, the numbers right. Um, if the person has, has changed their name for any reason, so that the, the name on the application doesn't match what's on the social security card, you have an option to provide that kind of information um, in, in the application, you should do that. Next slide, please. I, that did kind of, I thought there was one other slide. Um, just note, note that yes, you can also um, make sure that there, that you kind of follow the general rules for re resolving DMIs by uploading documents. Uploading documents rather than mailing documents is always gonna be much faster, but um, you know, um, so keep that in mind as well. Next slide, please. And I'll go into data um, identity proofing. Um, next slide, please. So identity proofing is not an eligibility requirement for um, marketplace coverage. However, it is a requirement to be able to utilize all the functions of an online application without somebody in the family being identity proof. Um, that means that they're not go that that family is not going to be able to submit the application online. They're not going to be able to select the plan online. All of that um, can happen through the telephone, you know, call center. But it it does become a lot more challenging um, for the individual for the family. Um, next slide, please. So the, there's a few steps in, um, in, in um, identity proofing. First, what will happen is that, that when somebody first goes into their um, healthcare.gov account, they will be asked for a variety of information for one individual in the family. I would select the individual who's most likely going to be able to pass an, a, <laughs> an identity proofing um, uh, test online. And, you know, if you think about who that might look like, um, that might look like somebody who is likely to have credit history, somebody who's lived in the U.S. for a long time. Those kinds of things would be best. Um, but not everybody is going to have somebody like that in the family. So just keep that in mind. Um, so if you're not able to go through an online identity proofing, which basically is going to depend heavily on, um, you know, picking out information that is available about an individual um, that's identified in the household um, based off of information that's in their credit history, and then they're going to be asked kind of challenge questions. We get all these kinds of things when you're opening up a bank account or, you know, a variety of different accounts go through these kind of online um, identity proofing processes, but they become very challenging for certain people, especially people who don't have credit history, haven't been in the U.S. for a long time. If you can't pass that, you'll be given the option to do an identity proofing over the telephone. Quite frankly, a lot of the people, um, again, if the reason why they can't get through the identity proofing is because there's no credit you know, um, type of information, it might be challenging also to go through the telephonic piece of it. Um, it and ultimately, uh, some people are going to have to um, 
provide documentation, um, you know, um, to be able to, to get through the identity proofing. This gets really confusing for families sometimes because they might be trying to resolve a DMI and trying to resolve this identity proofing and the notices that come might be very, very confusing to people. So, um, you know, I, it's it's not going to be perfect, and I just wanted to alert you to that. To that, um, that yes, in the long run, it does help if somebody can be identity proof. Then they can, and you know, if they weren't able to do it online or the telephone, sending in documents is helpful. But I wouldn't wait to get through the application process. I would go ahead and submit it over the telephone. In the meantime, um, you can go ahead. Next slide, please. You can go ahead and provide all the information. Oh, next slide. These are just the kinds of documents that you can provide, you know, to 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 mail in um, to prove your identity. What I would do if I was running into somebody who had to do that in the meantime, while they're being identity proofed um, through the mail, I would not wait. I would go ahead and fill out their application over the telephone. Um, and I would um, do everything. You, you, you can get pretty far in the applications. You can provide a lot of information in the application, um, but you won't be able to have things verified electronically the way that we've been talking about. You will then get on the telephone with the call center and provide any additional information that's needed to complete the application, and they will help you um, walk through the last steps, including picking a plan and all of those kinds of things. Um, you can do some searching of plans and looking, you know, um, utilizing the electronic screener tool for um, different health plans so that you um, are able to kind of visually look at um, the, the different kind of plans in the meantime. Um, but then, Again, you can still select the plan over the telephone so you're not delaying the individual. So, so you don't want to, you know, you may never see this person again. You want to make sure that they are able to enroll while you're also trying to get them to have a fully functioning account eventually because it's going to help them in the long run. Next slide, please. Okay. Q&A. Everyone, um, sorry, Shelby, to cut you off. Because we are um, at time, we are actually going to skip the Q&A for this session, but all of the questions in the chat will be saved. And so we will try our best to reach back out and answer the questions that we can. And as a reminder, um, these are the resources that were shown in today's slide deck and I will add it again in the chat before we close off. Here are the contacts of Shelby, Jennifer, and of course, if you have any questions, you can send them to beyondthebasics at cbpp.org. And as a reminder, our next webinar plan design is scheduled for next Tuesday, October 3rd at 2 p.m. You can register for this and our other upcoming webinars on the Beyond the Basics website. And again, if you need assistance or if you have any questions, please email at beyondthebasics at cbpp.org. And with that, we will bring this webinar to a close. Thank you again for joining us today.